a live uh, broadcast and as you can see I have resolved the problem of the portrait and landscape modes on this and what happened was uh, that the, a new feature was introduced in the um, by YouTube unfortunately they did say very clearly you have to change it in the settings and um, it was changed uh, but they didn't actually have it on uh, in in the language settings that I've got so my, my phone is actually in Polish it might have been in the English language one, but then it wasn't. It wasn't in the Polish language one. Anyway, it's now been put in, and so um, I can actually talk the white, the right, the right way round uh, as I'm now trying to do. So anyway, so um, we have a comment here that being really curious about this subject because um, it was somebody talked about Auschwitz Monowitz and um and tommy says lots of german companies have blood on their hands yes yeah, yeah that's quite true um lots of companies have blood and they're not just german ones um so i just changed the light here was this any better i'll turn this one off how's that sound ah yeah that's good isn't it right they're just like hollywood now um, right, so uh, if somebody was to ask you, say, well, wh why, did, uh, why did the Nazis lose the war? What was the number one thing that they were lacking? Um, the first thing that would come to mind, obviously, is oil. <clears throat> if Albert Speer were in here right now, well, he'd probably say oil just to agree with, because uh, uh, that's the way he was. He sort of just agreed, told people what they wanted to hear. But there's another product, which is rubber. And rubber uh, certainly played a major part in uh, Germany losing the First World War, uh, the lack of rubber, and uh, <clears throat> the... Uh, uh, so anyway, that's what I'm going to talk about. But anyway, just before I start, I uh, see Tommy. Tommy says he asked Siemens about what happened and they sent him a big book. Yeah, um, I was at a company last year uh, which makes car parts, and that's one of the biggest car parts uh, producers. Uh, the name itself, it's now got it's now a, a holding company, uh, a browser. It's based in Coburg. And uh, anyway, um, they named the street after the founder of the company. Now, during the Second World War, uh, this company did have slave laborers working there. <clears throat> and uh, in Germany today, uh, when they named the street after this gentleman, there was all sorts of protests and things of that nature. Now, I must admit, I was rather negatively um, uh, uh, actually, but positioned towards it because of, because of this. Uh, but when I actually started investigating and looking at it in more depth, I, I could see that, in fact, they didn't really have much choice in the matter. And uh, so, so there is the, these cases uh, where people are, um, these the slave labourers are sort of given to companies. You're told to produce something. They say they can't do it because they don't have the for uh, the the the, the, the um, man of what's that in English manpower, the uh, human resources. And then the SS comes along, so there you go, there's a pile of slave bravers, now make it happen. Now what they could do is they could have, A, they could have refused, in which case they'd, um, the, the, the company would have been taken over. Um, or possibly, anyway, possibly. Or B, uh, they can make the conditions better for those who are actually working there. And that, that is something which you can see in the recollections of many people who survived they say that when they, they were they, they were handed out to other company to private companies and these companies actually did give them the same food as they were giving to everybody else within within the, cap the capabilities that existed in in wartime not only that to a large extent they were actually protected and for example if you look at Schindler's list which is uh, largely true uh, the film I mean there's very few things in it which which uh, which are not true and um, but there you can see that the people who are actually working in this factory are protected and to, 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 a, to a large extent. Now, I know I talked to yesterday or the day before yesterday uh, about the Rosenstrasse protest and the uh, Jewish people who were working in these uh, factories, which were um, uh, when they raided the factories. 
uh, that was in uh, 1943 and the, the reason why the fact that the, but these were people still living at home so to speak they weren't in camps and the factory owners could do nothing uh, to really effectively in this case and not only that um, one of the reasons why they did this was to uh, to, to take ho take these Jewish people hold them uh, somewhere before sending them away to be killed but at the same time so that the factories uh, wouldn't start raising complaints that look we, we can't do without them uh, and as, as I said the other day I, I personally believe that uh, winning the war was less important to the Nazis than murdering the Jews because the whole point of the war was to get the hands on the Jews to murder them that is what I believe I think the, all the evidence points in that direction I don't see um, when there was a choice of sending a, a train load of uh, uh, ammunition to the front or a train load of Jewish people to a, uh, a death camp, then um, uh, then then th 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 they chose the latter. And um, I do appreciate, of course, that you know when you've got you know, budgets and timetables and things which have been organised in a certain way, you can't just suddenly say that okay instead of uh, instead of this the, the these jewish people who got here we're going to want to fill the, the train up with ammunition and we're going to send it off to the eastern front or something like that i do realize that that is not um, that's not how things happen in in the real world but it's the people who are making the allocations at the top somebody had to write out the the, tra the train timetables like mr dorpfmuller and he could have done it in such a way as to um, as as to ensure that ammunition went to where it had to go and that that people weren't being murdered. Of course, the thing is like this: it was Hitler making the decisions, and then below him, Hitler's passing it on to Himmler or or, or to to Kaltenbrunner, and then then the people are then uh, be, the suffering. Um, it, both pe bo bo both the the Jewish people are being murdered, and 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 the German normal German soldier at the front who's not getting the weapons to defend himself uh, in Hitler's war. So so th this this is where the whole the whole thing um, that's what's wrong. Anyway, so um, one of the aims of the what the Nazis did want to do, and this they started off even in 1933, this was to make the uh, country self-sufficient. And there's nothing unusual about this because lots of countries came up with the same thing. And after the crash of 1929, and the idea in many countries, well, you've got to export things. Well, things like this, one country's export is uh, another is imports. Now, today, um, it needs to be pointed out, in British politics in the last 10 years, the, those believing in Brexit think that the country can suddenly, suddenly become self-sufficient. Well, yeah, maybe maybe it can if you don't want to start eating oranges and uh, using rubber and uh, buying oil and all the rest of it but other than that you live in we live in an international space and therefore um this is the way things uh, this uh, are, are done these days so i'm sitting here in germany um speaking to you via a telephone uh, made in korea um i've got a computer here which was uh, made in taiwan uh, wearing a shirt which may be from India, I don't know, uh, etc. Et because one buys things from where they, people are, uh, things are specialised to do it. And the rubber tree uh, originally came from Brazil. Now, when I was at school, I was told this. I remember the teacher saying that um, uh, there were some rubber seeds were sort of um, smuggled out of Brazil because the Brazilian government didn't want anybody else getting their hands on the rubber. Uh, taken to Kew Gardens. From Kew Gardens, it was taken to Malaysia, um, or Malaya, as it was then called. And then in Southeast Asia, it was grown. Now, today, uh, the uh, main countries uh, producing rubber are... Five of the six are in top six, and that's about 93-4% of the entire world production are in Southeast Asia. So number one is um, Thailand, number two is, is Indonesia, number three is Vietnam, four, this is a surprise one, it's Ivory Coast, um, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, five is uh, China, and six is India. And um, so uh, in... Um, Nine, in, in, in the 1930s, uh, a large part of this was uh, uh, under 
uh, foreign uh, domination. Okay, Malaysia was then, or Malaya, uh, was, was then a major producer, which was uh, British. Uh, Indonesia was then Dutch East Indies. Uh, India was part of the United uh, British Empire. Uh, Vietnam uh, was part of the French Empire. Uh, only Thailand uh, of, uh, was was independent. Okay, China. I don't think China produced much rubber then. So the um, rubber is needed in all sorts of in industrial processes. It's needed. For example, the best example I can think of, uh, as far as the Second World War is concerned, is for things like lorries and tanks. It's said that Germany. Uh, one of the reasons why Germany couldn't actually produce. Uh, um, the, the vehicles during the First World War was because they didn't have anything to put on the tyres. So the tyres made of, of rubber and so that um, uh, so they had metal wheels on the roads which isn't particularly effective at doing anything. Now um, in, um, in the 19th century in France uh, in, uh, synthetic rubber was invented uh, for the first time, um, I, I believe it wasn't very good, uh, around 1905 or thereabouts, uh, somebody in Russia uh, invented a synthetic rub rubber uh, and a little bit later in the 20s there was one came up in Germany but none of these synthetic rubber products were um, all that good and, and another thing was about them is that they needed some uh, certain element of natural rubber in them now um so uh, rubber comes from trees but there is a, another product uh, no, not product, uh, another plant i should say sorry called the kazakh dandelion or the russian dandelion uh, which grows uh, what is today kazakhstan kyrgyzstan uzbekistan turkmenistan western zion and uh, this flower can produce rubber now i can recall using dandelions as a child, uh, it just occurred to me now as I was speaking right now, is that we'd, you'd open it up and a little bit of white sap sort of came out of it. Anyway, that's not the same dandelion, because that's the, our dandelions, different from, from this one. Uh, now, uh, in when Nazi Germany was allied to the Soviet Union, it was able to import fr uh, rubber from the Far East uh, via, uh, via, uh, uh, via that country. Um, but on the 22nd of June 1941, Nazi Germany attacked the Soviet Union and as a result, there was no rubber around. So it had to make uh, up this using uh, um, other sources. Now, the one big company uh, which was producing uh, or trying to produce synthetic rubber was IG Farben. Uh, Farben, of course, they're a paint company with a major chemical uh, concerned, uh, concerned. But the... the um, uh, the synthetic rubber was then called Buna, and this is named after a place um, somewhere near Halle, uh, where there was a factory attempting to to produce it. Indeed, as the war actually progressed, uh, this this was one of the targets for Operation. I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, bombing attacks on 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 uh, on on uh, Nazi Germany. Anyway, good. So, um, uh, the SS and uh, the, um, uh, the well, Nazi authorities, let's say, knew about this dandelion because in 1938, uh, the workers started on it at the Wilhelm, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Munchenberg. And um, although it wasn't very ad advanced, and indeed all the scientific papers uh, were largely uh, in Russian. And so, uh, after the attack on the, on, on the Soviet Union, uh, they started scouring around, not only for the plants where these things were actually being produced in the Soviet Union, but also uh, for the people that actually worked on them. So there was a number of research places, and fortunately, nearly all of them were, uh, for, sorry for the Nazis, uh, nearly all of them were in the West, uh, so it's Minsk, uh, Zhitomir, Kharkiv, and Kiev, and uh, so, so that may, all these places were captured, and um, and so they were able to get the hands on the, the some of the people who actually were producing it, as well as the papers and uh, other things. Now, um, in nine so so uh, in 1943, uh, Nazi Germany produced only on eight percent 
uh, of it, the rubber that it required. So this would, okay, scarcely even cover uh, civilian needs, never mind the army, and never mind the, uh, the the Blitzkrieg, which is going to need tanks and things, and lorries, which are going to uh, run off uh, on rubber. So Himlin uh, was named Special Commissioner for all questions of natural rubber, even though, of course, Himlin knew nothing about rubber, but he did know a lot about terrorizing people. So his idea was to um, get a um, human slave labor uh, these are the people who lived near the places where the dandelion was grown and um, and to, to disencourage people from um, uh, rebelling and not doing any work he sort of uh, got a hold of the children and so their people were actually held under threat now the person him that uh, uh, gave this task to somebody from the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute whose name was Herbert Backer. Her Backer was particularly well known as being the author of The Hunger Plan, uh, trying to starve millions of people for his own fantasy uh, agricultural and racial ideologies. Uh, indeed, the uh, breeding Kaiser Wilhelm uh, Breeding Institute, which had to look after this, trying to get this uh, rubber, uh, was named the Backer Institute in internal documentation. Anyway, um, so uh, the person uh, under him who was uh, looking after the rubber uh, uh, from the Kazakh um, from the from the Kazakh dandelion, Russian dandelion, uh, was a per Dr. R Richard. Uh, I'm sorry, Richard, Dr. Richard Burma, and he was a member of the SS and he had personal access to Himmler. Himmler put him in touch with somebody called SS Obersturmbahnführer Dr. Joachim Kaiser, and he was head of the agricultural department at Auschwitz, where an experimental cultiv cultivation uh, facility was set up in the town of Reisko. Uh, the, uh, many of these buildings still exist today. Reisko is to the south. Uh, of uh, Oshvien Chim uh, towards uh, Bielsko Biała, and um, th th this became a sub camp of Auschwitz. Uh, so, this, uh, the, the, there was um, the, Auschwitz had effectively three camps there was Auschwitz, the main camp, the second camp, Auschwitz Birkenau, which was the death camp, and the third one was Aus three was Monowitz, which is in the town. It's the, the, the chemical factory is still there today, and the, uh, that was uh, used for the production of synthetic rubber. But the experimental station was elsewhere. And uh, anyway, now one of the important things about this, about the experimental station, was that they had to grow the thing because they were doing experiments on it. And, uh, and as the people, okay, there were slaves, they were prisoners who were actually doing the work, but they were kept in relatively good conditions. Um, it, they were largely female inmates. Uh, the guards were, to a large extent, female. There was somebody called Joanna Bormann, who became quite well known. Elizabeth Haas, Annelies Franz, uh, Florentine uh, Kichon. Uh, and the uh, was the um, plant growing commander, the commandant was Heinz Schattenberg. Uh, there were around 320 prisoners um, looking after this by the middle of 1943. Uh, the number one nationality there was, was Polish, but there was also people from the Soviet Union, France, Yugoslavia and Germany. And there were also Jewish prisoners as well. And uh, so these prisoners had been sought out because they had knowledge in agriculture or maybe some agronomy and so, some other work means or, or science in general. Uh, not only that, though, um, and this may seem a bit odd, there were three uh, civilian scientists who worked, who lived nearby and they came to, to, to work there. So they'd work there from eight till four, whatever, was eight till five. And these people were largely from the Soviet Union, so they had been recruited in the Soviet Union and given a job. They hadn't been arrested and thrown on a train forced, and actually forced to do it. So uh, the rice school camp was fenced in, of course. Uh, there was five barracks in there. Two of them were for the prisoners and were, that they used. There was One was a workroom, um, there was a washroom, a lavatory and a kitchen. Uh, so they had hothouses, laboratory and experimental farm fields as well, uh, which was all in the immediate area. Um, 
uh, there were some male prisoners because they were the people who looked after, for example, the tool room and they repa repaired machinery and other things like and did the lifting and did the construction as and when it was needed. Now, uh, I said about the, the conditions were better. They were much better because to start off with, it was clean, had to be clean because they were doing research work. So so uh, they had hot water. The, 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 the barracks were heated. Uh, they wanted to keep the prisoners in good physical condition. They had beds and they had uh, sheets and blankets, they had uh, hot water to wash with, uh, their, their clothes were cleaned and uh, their, their food was uh, rel uh, comparatively much better uh, but they were aware probably uh, of the conditions in other places there. Now uh, when I talked about the uh, Rosenstrasse pro um, protest I mentioned that there were 25 prisoners who were sent to Monowitz, they were, and then from there they were sent back to Berlin and they were released. Uh, which was highly unusual for prisoners to be released from Auschwitz, but then again, in this case, it did actually happen. Uh, now, in Monowitz was obviously not as good as what it was like at Reisko, but it was still better uh, than it was in Auschwitz, which in turn was better than what it was in, in Birkenau, which, which was which was absolutely the the, the worst place to be. Uh, now. Um, so, uh, the prisoners, of course, are now in a difficult situation. What do they do? Because they're working for the enemy. The enemy's trying to kill them off. They know that that's happening. Uh, but on the other hand, um, they, ha they, they don't want to end up being sent to the base camp. Uh, so, they, they don't really know what to do. Um, there was... Uh, the 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 the, the Munchenberg, where the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute was based, was um, actually uh, closed uh, because it didn't make any sense to have one in Berlin, the other one in Auschwitz. So they so they cl closed the Munchenberg place and um, for the breeding institute and sent it to uh, to to Reisko, and that was for for reasons of efficiency. And now this wasn't particularly good because the person then who came in charge was a Dr. Ingeberg Lehner and he wasn't particularly nice uh, to the prisoners there. So the, the things actually got, got worse for many, many uh, prisoners. On the 18th of January 1945, uh, this camp was liquidated. The Soviet army was not so far away. And so the prisoners then had to join the death march, uh, or one of many uh, that left from Auschwitz. And uh, this they went in the direction of Wodyslav Shlonsky. And from there they were taken by train, because Wodyslav Shlonsky is a railway line, I know, because I got the train there last year. And from there they uh, went to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Um, the the thing is, of course, that Nazi Germany was unable to resolve the problem of how much rubber it actually needed for its war effort. And um, I, I, I accept that the lack of rubber is not as important as its lack of fuel, maybe even some other, other mineral resources uh, as well. But, but it was a, a major consideration. Um, uh, in the First World War, they could minimum produce lorries. If they had had, had um, rubber, could they have produced more things such as tyres and um, other, other parts which actually needed it? But the reason why this happened was the lack of planning. And it always comes back to the same thing, which was Hitler. Hitler, uh, he wanted to start a war because he was this crazed racist, but he wasn't prepared to... Um, plan it you see i do it quickly because before he died you had to start the war and um he didn't think of the consequences and the consequences in this case was the fact that rubber couldn't be obtained hitler often used to say my generals know nothing of the economic consequences of wars and he said this at the time of the uh, proposed uh, retreat from the area of nicopol in what is today southeastern Ukraine, and uh, but I would argue that it wasn't the generals; it was Hitler who didn't actually take these things into consideration. And indeed, the far more complex situation that existed in the 1940s and that had existed during the First World War. Anyway, uh, there's a bit of economics and. Um, I think that's about it for the moment. Um, thanks very much for watching. If anybody's got any questions, I don't know if anything came through there. 
Um, right, right. Robert says it was one of Himmler's harebrained schemes. Well, yeah, the uh, the the, the uh, rubber rubber production. Yeah, the, I mean the thing is this. I would say this. I wouldn't say it was entirely harebrained. The and there's a lot of logic to to actually producing uh, rubber. The thing was the way things were produced in Nazi Germany is it was totally inefficient. Uh, now, if you look at the United States for, or the Western Allies, United States, United Kingdom, uh, they also are being cut off from, uh, after uh, the Japanese took the um, uh, Southeast Asia. They also were cut off from sources of rubber, but they got round it. And uh, in the United States, I mean, there was a lot of production of synthetic rubber. Uh, the, the reason why Nazi Germany couldn't do it, possibly, was because of these proliferation of agencies. Nobody had responsibility and nobody really knew what they were doing that's in my opinion anyway okay thanks very much for being here today i'll uh, i'll probably do a video tomorrow and um in fact i can do one tomorrow monday and i can do one on tuesday and wednesday i'll probably have a meeting uh to do with the day job so i, I won't be able to do it um so anyway thanks for being here and all the best from me in germany bye for now